Welcome to City Church. We are a biblically based, relationally driven, spirit led church, encouraging everyone to follow Jesus, grow together, and serve others. We're excited to share this sermon with you today, and you can always find out more about us online at citychurchseville.com. Luke 11, 1 through 13. One day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John, meaning John the Baptist, taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us and lead us not into, tem into temptation. Then what Jesus does through verses 5 and 10 through 10 is he brings a parable on friendship that directs us in prayer. Then we pick up our reading again in verse 11. It says, Which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who would ask him? On the count of three, I want us to say Father out loud. One, two, three. Father. One more time. One, two, three. Father. And what I know is, when we say the word Father, there can be different emotions. I know this. My dad passed away in the first year of COVID on March 19th. He did not pass from COVID. He died from complications of old age. But what I do know is, is that the older I've gotten, the more I have grown to appreciate my dad. I know that. If you are younger and you are frustrated with your dad. I understand. One of my favorite quotes about fatherhood comes from Mark Twain. He said, when I was a boy of 14, my father was so ignorant I could hardly stand to have the old man around. But when I got to be 21, I was astonished at how much he had learned in the last seven years. What's interesting to note for us dads, us men, that Jesus presents the father-child relationship as central to Christian prayer. It's central. The Lord's Prayer begins by saying that word, Father. When you think about that, and you look at the Bible, and you look at the text, and you look at the teachings of Jesus, what you quickly find is that fatherhood in the Bible is a blessing. It's a good thing. As a matter of fact, it's framed in Scripture. Fatherhood is framed in Scripture as being one of the things that God smiles upon and encourages and brings strength to. It would be interesting to note that around the world today, birth rates are plummeting. A lot of people are choosing not to be fathers. There's many reasons for that. One of them is, studies have shown, is people are lacking hope. Why bring a child into this world? By the way, my dad's generation said the exact same thing. But what's really interesting to note is there's a direct parallel between birth rates and marriage. Marriage is essential, and it's studied. It's essential for children. That marriage is part of bringing children into the world. So what I'm saying is, is if you live by this, and you live in the kingdom of God, the text teaches us that marriage is a blessing. And so is having kids. It's a blessing. And the reason why I'm sharing this is, 
as I was thinking about fatherhood in our culture. And what dawned on me is I could not think of a television show, and I don't watch much, but I couldn't think of a television show that had a positive fatherhood role model. I couldn't think of one. Now, there might be a couple, but I think maybe you have to go to the 70s to find one. The most famous father I saw on television was Archie Bunker. (laughs) He was the antithesis to everything biblical a father should be. But what I think is, I think that our culture is moving against fatherhood. Know this, the text doesn't. The biblical reality, the reality of the kingdom of God is that fatherhood is a blessing, and so is having children. And one of the reasons is, is with God, you never lose hope. You don't lose hope because you know how to trust a good heavenly father. Now, if we were to look at our text, it's very clear that Jesus sees being a father as a good thing. It's a positive not a negative. Now, what fascinates me, though, is in Jesus' teaching on the Lord's Prayer here in Luke, which is sort of the skeletal infrastructure of the longer Lord's Prayer found in the book of Matthew on the Sermon on the Mount, that Jesus, in that, when he concludes teaching the Lord's Prayer, instantly goes into a parable. Here's the first line of the parable that teaches us about prayer. Then Jesus said to them, who's the them? It's his disciples. Then Jesus said to them, his disciples, Jesus did have women disciples, but in this context, it's relatively clear that it was the 12 men. It says, then Jesus said to them, suppose you have a friend and you go to him at midnight and say, friend, lend me three loaves of bread. If you were to read on, you would find in the text that the reason why the lending of bread is needed is because another friend is coming to visit unannounced, and the host, the man, has run out of bread. As I was thinking about Jesus' teaching on prayer, I noticed that friendship for men was the parable he chose. What's interesting to note is that there are an increasing number of lonely men in our culture. The most conservative study I read this week said post-1990 that loneliness among men has gone up no less than 15%. Thomas Joyner in his groundbreaking book, Lonely at the Top, says that men have made a trade of success in the external world for a deep sense of loneliness, emptiness, and disconnection. Studies have shown that boys start out feeling just as connected in their close friendships as girls do, but they tend to neglect their personal relationships to pursue external success. When men lose the protective social structures provided in high school or college, they often find themselves interpersonally adrift, unsure how to establish or maintain close relationships with other men. It's fascinating. Another study put out by Oxford University said this, what determined whether friendships survived with girls was whether they made the effort to talk more to each other on the phone. Said Dunbar, who led the Oxford study, what held up male friendships was doing stuff together, going to football match, going to the pub for a brick, a drink, playing five-a-side, those are all British games, And they had to make the effort. There was a striking difference among the sexes. And so what we know is, ladies, you live in a cellular world. If you have a cell phone, (laughs) men, we have to go and do. Men have known this. But it's interesting to notice that the study says this, that men go and do in order to maintain friendships. 
Again, it's fascinating to me that Jesus, in the middle of teaching on prayer, uses a parable on friendships between men and says this, you have a friend that you you know you can go and bug at midnight to borrow three loaves of bread. I have a question. How do you borrow three (laughs) loaves of bread? That's never made sense to me. You borrow it. You consume it. I guess you bake three more and give them back or go to Walmart and buy the cheap stuff and give it back, whatever the case is. But notice in here, Jesus has an assumption in his kingdom, and the assumption is, men, we have a friend that you can call in the middle of the night to borrow loaves of bread because you have another friend coming to visit. I don't say this to put guilt and shame on anyone. That's not why I'm doing this. I'm doing us for us to kind of begin to think as men about the kingdom of God and Jesus leading us and what the text has to say, that Jesus knows how the kingdom works. And the kingdom involves a concept of fatherhood. It also involves a concept of friendship that is exceptionally important. Now, in this parable that Jesus tells on prayer, He says something. He says, you know, as a father, if your son comes and asks for a fish, you're not going to give him a serpent. That's what the parable is, or the little talk is that we read near the end. But in Luke 11, 12, he says something very odd. Jesus says, or if your son asks for an egg, you will give him a scorpion. Now, the reptilian connection between fish and snake makes sense to me. But when I look at this last one, your, your, your kid comes and asks for an egg over easy, and instead you go, nah, here's a scorpion. So how many of you men would even know where to find a scorpion? You don't even know where they are. Well, one of the rules of biblical understanding, and for those of us here at City that are following through with the Bema Project, it's a Bema podcast that teaches us how to read the Bible well, you would know that if something seems odd, it's odd for a reason. Fish and serpent make sense. There's the reptilian connection. But then all of a sudden, someone asks for an egg and gives them a scorpion. It seems weird. Well, what biblical readers teach us that read the Bible well will say, if you see this offhanded type of a remark, all you do is do a quick word study, and Jesus is referencing an episode from the Older Testament every time. It's crazy how often this happens. And so what I did in preparation for this message is I just simply put in a Bible program called Version. I just put it in there. Actually, I used Gateway Bible for this. I put in Scorpion, and instantly it popped in the Older Testament, and there's a story where it's repeated, and so you know that's the story. So I go to that story, and here's the story that I read. 2 Chronicles 10, 6 through 12. So Jesus, again, is teaching father-son relationship, teaching on it in prayer, and in that, he mentions Scorpion. So here's the story. Then King Rehoboam consulted the elders who had served his father Solomon during his lifetime. How would you advise me to answer these people? Here's the context. King David is dead and gone. King Solomon was David's son. Solomon is dead and gone. But we know from biblical records, Solomon was the wisest man that ever lived. But what's interesting is at the end of his life, the wheels came off. For those of us who are kind of biblically deep people, it's interesting to note that every king had a prophet that spoke into their life for God, but Solomon. He's the one that didn't have one. And so when we look in our text, what we find is Rehoboam, who is Solomon's son, is there, and his people have come to him with a request. And so he goes to the elders that had advised his father Solomon and asked, how should, you, how should I answer the people? Let's read on. It says, they replied, if you will be kind to these people and please them and give them a favorable answer, they will always be your servants. By the way, the request was that Solomon, near, his, near the end of his life, had become brutally harsh to the people of Israel and milked them for everything he could get. 
verse 8, but it says, But Rehoboam rejected the advice the elders gave him and consulted the young men who had grown up with him and were serving him. He asked them, What is your advice? How should we answer these people who say to me, Lighten the yoke your father put on us? And the young men who had grown up with him replied, The people have said to you, Here's the complaint by the people of Israel. Your father put a heavy yoke on us, but make our yoke lighter. Now tell them, my little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Does that not sound like leadership insecurity? My father laid on you a heavy yoke. I will make it even heavier. My father scourged you with whips. I will scourge you with scorpions. In verse 17, it says, all the Israelites went home. And in verse 19, it says, so Israel has been in rebellion against the house of David since that day. You see, the older men knew some things. And when Rehoboam, who's this young new king, went to them and asked for advice, he refused to listen to it, but he would only listen to his peers. And his peers had grown up with him And in quotes, they served him. How honest do you actually think his peers were going to be? You see, there's something in the Bible, in the book of Proverbs, is filled with this. That men, for those of us who are younger, there are those men who are farther down the turnpike of life. A wise young man would find someone further down the turnpike and ask them questions of life. It's wise. The text teaches that. But isn't it interesting to note that Jesus mentions scorpions in the little parable he's talking about between father and son. Every Jew that knew his Bible knew this story. They would have instantly thought about how Rehoboam and his father Solomon and all of that interrelational dynamics and how Rehoboam ignored the voice of his elders. You see, Jesus is making a hint. The Hebrews call it a remez to the Older Testament in his teaching on prayer and also on being a father. Now, as we close out our time, It's interesting to note that Jesus, as he begins to conclude his teaching on prayer, says to his disciples, how much more will your Father in heaven give to those who ask him? If you would remember in our initial reading, I don't know if you recall, But Jesus, after doing this incredible teaching on prayer, where father and son and children and all of this is brought into the center, he says to his disciples, how much more will your father in heaven give? Success? Money? Victory in battle? What is it? Well, here's what the text says. Jesus says, how much more? Will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? As we put feet to our faith, this goes for everyone, but specifically the men. Have you ever asked for the Holy Spirit in your life? That's what Jesus just said. Of all the things he could have said, about approaching God as Father and asking him for something. He could have put anything in that line, but he puts this. How much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Men, have we asked for the Holy Spirit? We've done that. And next, I think about the Lord's Prayer. I think about this prayer that we can close our eyes and quote. Men, let's humble ourselves this day. Let's ask God for our daily bread, for forgiveness, and for God to lead us. One of the things that studies have shown is that success and arrogance go hand in hand. Success and pride, hand in hand. Promotion and looking down on others can go hand in hand. 
But you see, in the kingdom of Jesus, every man is called to ask God daily for daily bread, admitting that it's not me who has done this. It's you. The Lord's Prayer calls us to ask for forgiveness. Men, maybe you're wired differently than I am, and I hope that you are. But asking for forgiveness is a difficult thing for me to do. But if the Lord's Prayer is a prayer that we are called to pray daily in the kingdom of God, then we're asking God for forgiveness daily, and that primes us to do that for people. The willingness to admit when we're wrong and to ask for forgiveness when we're wrong. And then the last part of that prayer is for God to lead us. How can it be bad for a man, whether young or up in senior of years, to daily ask God for daily bread, to daily ask God for forgiveness, and to daily ask God to lead my life, that he is the one that I'm committing to follow. At this time, I'm going to ask all the men to stand. Men, can we close our eyes in God's presence? I want to challenge us as men that we would be people who would be willing to pray the prayer that Jesus said we should pray. And that is, is that our Heavenly Father would give us the Holy Spirit if we would ask Him. Men, as we stand before the throne of grace, can you imagine that God wants to give to us His Spirit? His Spirit that hovered over creation. His Spirit that's omnipresent. omnipresent. His Spirit that's omniscient. His Spirit that is knowing the mind of God and can reveal it to our hearts. Jesus says that's what God wants to give us. So could we as men just for a moment? Again, if you're comfortable, just extend your hands in front of you, men. As a sign of humility and receptivity before the Lord. God, please, give us your Holy Spirit. In a world that is filled with so much confusion, give us your wisdom. God, help us as men, through your Spirit, to know the mind of God and to live fully in the kingdom of God to take our cues from the kingdom and not from this world. God, I pray very specifically that you would bless every single dad. The text says this is a good thing. To be a father is a good thing. It's not without its pain. It's not without its griefs and its joys. But the text says it is a good thing. And now, Father, as all of us men stand into your presence, we ask for our daily bread. We ask that you would forgive us. We ask that you would lead us. And we do all of this in Jesus' name. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.